And my prayer is that we will increasingly understand, embrace, and experience the Christian life. Live by faith, fueled by prayer. Today we're looking a second time at this lesson on the importance of faith. And you really could have called it the importance of faith and prayer, the connection of the two. Looking at Mark chapter 9, verses 14 to 29, I would ask you to find that in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, see me after the service, we'll be glad to get you one. But, if, but for right now, if you don't have a Bible, uh, we'll have the text on the screen. But find Mark 9, 14 to 29 in your Bibles. And stand with me as we read. If you'll follow along as I read this passage for our consideration today. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, that is Jesus, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you for he has a spirit that makes him mute. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. They brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy. And he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the father, his, the boy's father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And it's often cast him into fire and into water and just to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can. All things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse so that most of them said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. When he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. This is a powerful passage. We've read what together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. We know it's true. We be wonderful to have childlike faith and believe it because it's true. We need to be taught by it today. Some things rushed out of our thinking, other things brought in. May the Lord do that while we study this together. Thank you. Be seated. Well, I told you last week this, this happens. In the aftermath of the, the Mount of Transfiguration experience, they're coming down out of the mountain. Peter, uh, James, John coming with Jesus. The nine disciples on the ground while the three have been gone with Jesus to have that wonderful experience up there. The nine disciples have found themselves in a dilemma because a father has approached them looking for Jesus, really. He wants Jesus to, he believes Jesus can, can uh, do something with this demon that's possessed his son. But Jesus isn't there. And so the disciples, I believe, based on what they had experienced earlier that we have recorded in Mark's gospel, because they had gone out two by two with the authority of Jesus and the power of Jesus, saw demons submissive to them, I believe that they take it upon themselves to cast out this demon from this boy. And, and the scribes are there. They're always around. <laughs> They're always watching. The scribes and the Pharisees are always looking for something to accuse, something to point out, some, some, 
defect, some deficiency, some inconsistency in the ministry of Jesus and his followers, and they engage in an argument. And Jesus walks into the scene. The, the crowd, we're told, looks at him, and they're, they're amazed by him. We've suggested to you, and several commentators suggested that he still had the glow, something of the Shekinah from the transfiguration on the mount, and he still is glowing somewhat like Moses did when he came down from the mount, having encountered God with the uh, receiving of the Ten Commandments. And they're amazed. They're enthralled. But this scene is full of tragedy from several angles. Tragedy at the faithlessness of the crowd. The preference to arguing over believing. The tragedy that his own disciples went about this the wrong way and were, were themselves, by the way they approached it, a part of the faithless generation. The desire of the dad longing to see his son healed, going out of his way to seek out Jesus, to put this son before Jesus, on the way believing if he could just find Jesus, just encounter Jesus, his son would be healed. And when the moment comes, if, Jesus, if you can do anything, it's tragic. It's tragedy, however, that ends with great triumph and then a teaching lesson. My friend Ernie Reisinger used to say, Bill experience is a queer teacher. She gives you the test and then the lesson. And that's what's happening here. Let's look at this today under, under four headings. First of all, Jesus' frustration with faithlessness. Second, Jesus' frustration with faith mixed with doubt. Third, Jesus' fury with demonic dominion. And then fourth, Jesus' focus on prayer as an energizer to faith. Let's, let's pack, unpack this here. This frustration that Jesus has with faithlessness. Jesus walks into the situation where there's a crowd gathered. Religious leaders, the nine disciples duking it out verbally over probably something to do with, with the manner, the approach that you take in casting out a demon. There's, there was a whole list of, in, in Judaism of how you went about to cast out a demon. These disciples had simply seen Jesus do it instantaneously and then they had experienced that themselves and so no doubt there was this wrangling going on that the disciples had not followed, once again, abandoned Jewish tradition in terms of how to do something like cast out a demon. And so there's the, there's the argument going on there. The crowd sees Jesus, verse 15. They're amazed. His, Spurgeon suggests, no doubt, his face was resplendent with some relics of the glory which had beamed from him upon the holy mountain. It's remarkable that the people were not terrified but ran to him and not from him and and Spurgeon makes this observation about that verse the glories of Jesus are always attractive and that's true when you've seen the glory of Jesus Christ with eyes of faith you you run to him you don't run from him the only time you run from him is when you're when you're wrapped up in and protecting your sin so in verse 16 Jesus asked, and it's not clear, commentators are divided on this. Some think he was asking the disciples, what are you arguing about with them? Others think he focused right on the scribes, what are you arguing about with, with my disciples? It's not, it's not clear here. But either way you look at it, there's an argument going on when there ought to be ministry going on. That's, that's going to be a lesson for us, I think. Someone from the crowd answered, now, he wasn't asking this individual. He was either asking his disciples or he was asking the scribes, but someone else from the crowd who happens to be the dad answered, teacher, teacher is, is the equivalent of rabbi. He's, he's recognizing Jesus as a religious authority. Teacher, I brought my son to you for he has a spirit that makes him mute. 
When, I know, teacher, when this is happening to him because he, he can't speak. But that's not the worst of it. When, when he has an episode where this spirit manifests intensely in him, not only does he go speechless, but the spirit convulses him. He, he, the boy is thrown into a fit. He foams, grinds his teeth, becomes rigid. We would, we would recognize that in our day as something like a grand mal seizure, if you've ever seen that. But this is not a medical condition. This is a, this is a demonic situation. There is a medical condition called epilepsy. In fact, the term is used in Matthew that we read. This is a demonic situation. This doesn't require a doctor. This requires a miracle. So I ask your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. There's, we're going to come back to that, and we look at some lessons here. You weren't here. I asked them. In fact, you can imagine that they probably said, well, Jesus isn't here, but we know how to do this. We've done this before. But they were not able. And Jesus responds to the whole situation, which was supposed to be about a little boy who had a need. And it had become something else became a theological argument. He said, oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? You have to understand, yeah, Jesus was, com was completely the Son of God. He was also completely human. He's completely divine and completely human. And he has human weariness. It's not a sin to be weary. The disciples have seen him perform all kinds of miracles. How long am I to be with you? What, what will it take for you to get where you ought to be? We're not talking about folks who met with him weekly. We're talking about men who lived with him 24-7 for three years, three and a half years by the time his time on earth was over. How long am I to bear with you? Now, it's one thing to be with you. What's it going to take? Another thing, how much more can I take? A weary Savior who's walked by faith, who's told him, I speak nothing except what the Father tells me to speak. I do nothing except what the Father tells me to do. I've come to do my Father's will, not my own will. And his children have been raised from the dead. The, the blind have been made to see. The lame walk. Thousands are fed miraculously. And at this point, it seems the disciples have missed it. They've, there's a disconnect. But unabated, weary, with the disciples coming up short, weary, with his labor in their midst, he says, bring him to me, bring the child to me. And brings them back to the whole purpose of the encounter. And we see this, secondly, this frustration with faith mixed with doubt. His, his dad has stepped out of the crowd. He's, he's explained the situation. So verse 20 says, they brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him immediately, it convulsed the boy and fell down on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And you will mark this, I told you early on, you can read through the Gospels, and every time demonic forces come near to Jesus of Nazareth, they are undone. This demonic Spirit is, is railing, wreathing, it's because Jesus of Nazareth has said, bring him to me. Sometimes, by the way, when we're working with someone and pointing them to Christ and walking with them until they, until they close with Christ, 
Sometimes things get much worse before they get better. Sometimes agony precedes the, the glory of the dawn of seeing Jesus Christ as willing and able to save and experiencing that saving power. You're going to see that as you share the gospel with people. Not just in passing, but when you share the gospel and you walk with them. You're going to see the intensifying of, of Satan and his minions as, as they discover they are losing a grip. Because the more you speak the gospel, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on my friend, have mercy on my neighbor. The more you speak of Jesus, the more intimidated the prince of darkness and his minions become. Jesus looks at the Father and says, how long has this been happening to him? Now, Jesus knows the answer to that. Sometimes he asks questions in the gospel to, to bring the issue into perspective, and the, and the Father quickly answers from childhood. And it's often cast him into fire, into water to destroy him. I, think about what he said here. I've had to grab my son as he, as he flings himself toward fire. We, fire's not even safe around our house. When we have a fire to cook or something, I have to watch my boy because as long as not, he, he will leap into the fire as this demon tries to destroy him. Water, when we get around a body of water, it's not safe. I have to be careful because he will thrust himself at the water and drown. And I... So the father, in the midst of explaining how, the, how the, the day in, day out, See, there's some frustration going on here. Jesus, day in and day out, has been with the disciples and sees, has a frustration about their faithlessness and about, about how they're not getting it. They're not, they're not making the connection between spiritual power and him. And the Father now is, fr is expressing his frustration. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help. Now, the frustration Jesus has with his disciples is different than the frustration he has with this dad in need. Jesus rebukes him. If you can, but he doesn't stop there. In the midst of his rebuke comes a word of hope. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know that that's, that's a good place to live. Don't, don't run from, don't don't fear the rebuke of Jesus Christ because, because he will often follow it with a word of hope and then with action. You see, Jesus doesn't require perfection from us in order for him to act. He insists on faith. And we can see in this, this passage, while there's frustration at faith mixed with doubt, there's also the promise we read it in, in Matthew that if, if faith the size of a grain of mustard seed is employed... Great things can happen. And the man receives the rebuke. Jesus says, all things are possible for one who believes, who is believing, who, who, is, who is moving in life toward a posture of continually believing. Not believing and doubting. Not praying, oh Lord, save, save my neighbor, but I wonder if he'll be saved. Now, the casting of ourselves completely upon, upon the Lord. Immediately the father of the child cries out, I believe. Help my unbelief. Lord, I believe, and I don't want, it. I don't want any more unbelief. I believe, and I offer to you my unbelief. I, I believe, and I'm not going to justify my unbelief. I, I believe, and I want to... I want to become a dad. I want to become a man who, who, when talking of you and the possibilities with you, only believes. He receives the rebuke. And he grows in it. You know, you may be there sometimes. It's better to be there, I believe, help my unbelief, than it is to be, well... I just don't know if I believe or not. But the best place is to move beyond unbelief, to move beyond doubt, to believe. Simply believe. 
wholly believe. James teaches this in James chapter 1, verses 5 to 8. If, if you lack wisdom, ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and will be given to him. God, it's, it's interesting. God, do you realize God wants to give us, in terms of wisdom and, and life lived as a faithful follower of Christ, he wants to give us more than we're willing to ask. He, he, he longs to give us that. But there's a connection. And in the means... One of, the, one of the chief means God uses to give us the things we need to live a life of godliness, to be more than conquerors, is, is for us to ask of him, to recognize he is the supply. Verse 6, let him ask in faith, not doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that's driven and tossed by the wind, just back and forth. The scripture talks about being blown about by every wind of doctrine. No, no mooring, no, no anchor for the soul, no confident, consistent trust in the crucified and risen Savior Jesus Christ. Glancing at him and gazing at our circumstances rather than gazing at him and glancing at our circumstances. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Jesus sees faith mixed with doubt as instability and not the single-mindedness that he calls for and develops in followers of Jesus Christ. Third, we see that his fury with demonic dominion. When Jesus saw that the crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit. And Jesus knew more about the spirit than the father did. When Jesus speaks to a spirit who, who makes his, the son mute and deaf, Jesus' words ring true and they, they pierce. I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And that's his power over the demonic. After crying out, we're told, and convulsing this child terribly, the spirit came out and the boy was like a corpse so that most of them said, he's dead. The dad had, now, I don't know if he was dead or not. Again, it's... But the dad had probably never seen, had not seen the boy in such calm circumstances. No more thrashing. No more danger. They said he's dead. Jesus took him by the hand, dead or not, and lifted him up, and the boy arose. See, it didn't matter the boy's circumstances, the situation. What mattered was, will Jesus take him by the hand? And he did. Folks, that always happens. Just parenthetically, there's a lot of, a lot of teachings on demonology and, and, and spiritual warfare, but mark this down. When you're a follower of Jesus Christ, when Jesus Christ has come and taken your life as to be his follower, the devil has no power over you except what you give him. Jesus gives his spirit to us who is greater in us than he who is in the world. The fourth thing I want you to see is Jesus focus on prayer as an energizer to faith. They get alone in verse 28 and they entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. What is he saying to them? They didn't pray. They didn't pray. The situation is presented to them. And they think we've done it before. And Jesus teaches them, prayer must be your movement. Prayer must be your first resort. A fellow said one time, talking with another man, said, well, how's the situation going? And he said, he said I believe it's so, it's so bad, all we can do now is pray. The other man responded, has it come to that? So we get it backwards. We think prayer is the last thing. We think prayer is the place you go when it's desperate. No, prayer is the place you go when the situation is presented cannot come out by anything but prayer. Some suggest, well, this is a different kind of demon. I suggest to you that, that Jesus is teaching 
the importance of prayer connected with faith. I want us to, you know, James 5, 13 to 18, I've preached on this before, so I'm not going to preach on this again today, except just to, to cite something here. It's talking about someone sick among them, verse 15, and the prayer of faith, we talked about that, the prayer offered in faith, the prayer prompted by faith will save the one who's sick and the Lord will raise him up. In verse 16, talking about confessing sins to one another, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Effectual, fervent prayer. I want to just quickly cite six lessons we need to learn from the passage. First of all, it's easier to argue about faith than to practice faith. That's what they were doing. They were fussing with the religious people. Religious people were dogging them about this, that, and the other, and they were defending themselves. It's easier, folks, to argue about faith than it is to practice faith. We need to be careful that we don't become people who, who are content to, to debate the fine points of faith, who know that the Greek word, the noun is pistis, the, the Greek verb is pistuo, and etc., etc., etc. Practice faith. Secondly, Past spiritual power is not nurtured by, if not nurtured by prayer, can turn into present spiritual presumption. And I think that's exactly what happened to these disciples. We've done this in the past. We know how to do this. They had seen a powerful expression. The demons were subject to us, they said. But you see, what happened was they became presumptuous presently. We will never get mature enough in the Christian life that we can afford to avoid first and foremost going to God in prayer and saying, Lord, we need you. We need you. If you don't move, there'll be no movement. We need you in this situation. That's what prayer is. I've taught you that for 10 years. It is the one practice of the people of God that proves that we really believe we are dependent upon God. We can do everything else in our own strength. I can preach in my own strength. You can teach in your own strength. You can sing in your own strength. You can give in your own strength. You can share the gospel in your own strength. But prayer, only prayer, shows that we know we need God. And if we don't have God in the situation, then it's going to be Foolishness. Failure. Third, mixing faith with doubt often results in spiritual powerlessness. <laughs> we need to learn to pray, not only, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, but Lord, I believe, and I give you my unbelief. I believe in you. You've done, you died and rose again and saved me. You save me from my sin. You save me from hell. You can save me from my unbelief. I give it to you, Lord. I, I believe in it. And, and, and I think, I really believe, folks, that, that there's, a, there's often a powerlessness, not because the gospel doesn't have power, but because we, the people of God, are not single-minded, faithful people, people of faith. Fourth, the remedy to doubting faith is acknowledging absolute and utter dependence upon the power of God. You and I were absolutely dependent upon Jesus to save us. We did not bring one subatomic particle to the equation of being saved by grace through faith. We were dead in trespasses and sins. And the gospel was brought to us, maybe, maybe for some of us, time and time and time again. And one day that gospel was attended with life by the Spirit. When it would be described in Romans 10, you heard him. And the hearing of him was the result of life-giving power. You were absolutely dependent upon the Lord to save you. Guess what? We're absolutely dependent on the Lord to keep us. We're absolutely dependent upon the Lord. To use us. If you think, well, I've taught Sunday school for X number of years, let me tell you something, you're, you're as dependent this morning to teach. Well, I've preached almost 40 years. I'm, I'm as dependent this morning for the Spirit 
to come upon me, to speak through me, or if this will simply be an exercise in hypothetical Christianity. Absolutely, utterly dependent upon the power of God. In, and we express that in prayer. There's the value of prayer meeting. Prayer, prayer is not only taught, it's caught. And you may be an incredible prayer warrior in your closet. And if you are, I say, I thank God for you. And if, and if you are, I say, please come and be with us on Wednesday. We need, we need your example. We need to catch that congregation. You may say, well, I'm not very good at prayer. Well, I've got a great place for you. It's taught and it's caught. And it's absolutely important. Fifth, Jesus has absolute power over the forces of Satan and always conquers him and them. And, and so we need not fear. The only thing we need, we need to have fear of is, am I surrendering ground to the enemy of my soul? Because if I'm not surrendering ground, he can't take it. He can't take it. Sixth, finally, we must learn the valuable lesson on the importance of faith, its connection to prayer, its tending necessity, if we're going to live a life whereby we are more than conquerors through him that loved us, Romans 8, 37. Those things are not connecting, which they weren't for the disciples, which was the reason for Jesus' frustration with them, if they're not connecting then we will not be living as if we're more than conquerors. We'll be living as one fellow said, how are you doing? He said, well, I'm doing pretty well under the circumstances. He said, what is a believer doing under the circumstances if we're more than conquerors? John Bunyan, and I'm going to close with these two quotes from John Bunyan, said, you can do no more than pray after you have prayed. In other words, nothing more important than pray after you have prayed. But you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. How often have we tried to do more, but we haven't bathed it in prayer? And then finally, prayer will make a man cease from sin, or sin will entice a man to cease from prayer. Jesus teaches a lesson on faith, and he ties it to the importance of prayer. And if we separate that, we will not be walking by faith as we could and as we should, and we will not be experiencing power in prayer, and we will not see the Lord move the way we want to see him move in our own lives personally, in our families, in our church, and through our church to minister to the neighborhoods around us and the nations around the world. Will we learn that lesson? Will we take the lesson Jesus taught them and say, we're followers, we want to learn that lesson. We need to learn that lesson. We need to hear you say to us, Lord, this doesn't come out except by prayer. Not by programs, not by knowledge. Well, I know all about demon, demonology. I know all about spiritual warfare. I went to a conference one time. No. Lord, I believe. And I give you my unbelief so that my relationship with you will be one of faith, walking by faith, not, not doubting. Not like a wave tossed about by the wind. But as we sang this morning, standing firm upon the foundation of Christ alone, who lived and died and rose again, that we might have life. Let's pray.